What's up? Welcome to a new episode of Movie Schmovie. This is episode number 362. My name is Steve. I'm one of the co-hosts of the show. And as always, I'm joined by Brock. And John, 362, which means we've gone around in a circle plus two more degrees. And three divided by or six divided by three is two. It, it, it all two times three is six. It, like it works. This is powerful stuff. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. That's what we do with these numbers, guys. Powerful numerology. That's what you get for free at the top of the show. Well, the whole show's free, but I mean, that's what you get right out the gate. Right. Right. It's like real good, like number stuff. Um, we'll numer- admit that we numerology. found out uh, over the break that our show is big in math circles and, and in numerology circles. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. we're kind of playing to them now. Definitely leaning into it. I mean, it's as simple um, as one, two, three. <laughs> Guys, good to see you. Uh, we had a little bit of a break. And by see you, I mean, for those looking at the YouTube channel, youtube.com yeah. slash movie movie podcast um but yeah we had a few weeks off and we're back this week to talk finally about john's pick for required viewing society uh which we've been eager to talk about 1989 uh never has required viewing been more required right right we're gonna also talk a little bit about some uh, some other new releases uh mainly ones that you can watch at home right now in some way or shape or fashion uh we'll be talking about the new i don't know what is it? Dark comedy, yeah, th- drama thriller. I don't know. Uh, the menu, which is on HBO Max and maybe on Disney Plus by the time this uh, <laughs> this podcast comes out. That's that weird combination release that they have there. Um, and then also the new Ryan Johnson Knives Out film. The glass. It's called Glass Onion: A Knives Out Mystery, which is uh, on Netflix now. Uh, came out over the holiday weekend or week. Uh, for Christmas, and uh, we'll go to those later in the show. But here at the top, there's a couple of trailers that came out actually just in the past day or two before we we're recording this that we wanted to mention uh, quickly before we get into John's pick for required viewing. Um, I guess most notably for me, at least, was because it's been kind of put off and put off, and I've kind of heard rumblings about what the trailer was at a couple of the conventions over the summer. Mm-hmm. But um, we finally saw the first trailer for Evil Dead Rise. Um, which we got some key art for earlier in the week, which the poster was kind of okay. I didn't really like love the poster. It reminded me of the smile poster a little bit. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people were saying that, but I, it was definitely a quick first impression. Um, but yeah, uh, this is the new, it, I guess Sam Raimi um, has a hand in this, the production in terms of producing. Um, and uh, Bruce Campbell also, I saw intro did. He has a producer credit on it. But um, Lee Cronin is the director for this film. Again, this has kind of been coming down the pike here for a bit. And I've heard good things about it. But uh, the trailer finally came out this week. And immediately I was men- messaging you guys on our thread that uh, I just think it looks awesome. Um, we've talked about it a couple of times in the podcast, but I think we're all really big fans of the remake uh, of Ev- Evil Dead from what was that? 2013. Yeah, I think so. Um, I just but this, watched this, it. Yeah, like this, this, this has come up multiple times. One of the better remakes, you know, we, I love the movie. And I mean, just the really quick, my quick feeling watching this trailer for this, it definitely feels more like in that lane of what that movie felt like in terms of tone and, yeah. you know, the gore and just kind of how like, I don't know, mean or I don't know, just like it feels very like dark. Um, the trailer and, you know, some of the some of the gags even in the trailer that for me, that cheese grater really stood out. Um, along the <laughs> the body limb, but yeah. um, I don't know what 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 did you guys think uh, of the first look at Evil Dead Rise, uh, the new the new entry in the franchise? What do you think, Ronald? Um, I think one of the things that separates because uh, people have seen everything, man. At this point, mm-hmm. right? everything's so self referential and referential to other stuff. I think one of the things that really separates <laughs> movies like this in the 2013 movie from other things is how unrelenting it is mm-hmm. right um i think what we're kind of seeing this cool renaissance where it's like these like high art horror films that have kind of come out in the last 10 years or so with that that are um, incredible and i love those two the like slow burn movies and then uh, there's there's like movies like this and terrifier where it's like non-stop <laughs> the non-stop crazy from start to finish that doesn't really give you a chance to say i'm not scared of this thing because the things the things in front of you you've never seen before and um 
it's going to keep going. You know, it goes right, a little right. further, shows you a little more than you used to. So I'm excited, man. I'm excited as shit. And I agree with you um, that it feels like it's kind of the 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 big brother of the one that came out in 2013. It feels like the like a little bit more money got put into this one. Uh, yeah, but I'm excited. I don't know where this fits in the franchise. Is it related to the TV show? Like, I don't know where this fits in to it. You know, uh, I, I, I think that that's, and I guess I'll use that as kind of the entree to my thoughts on this, is that I sure. think that this is one of those great franchises that, I mean, it's not quite like Mad Max, but like when mm. George Miller comes back to do a Mad Max film, he doesn't sit down and and like closely view right, the, right. the 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 mythology of the past movies and try to make something mm -hmm. that satisfies all the questions we have about this world. Sam Raimi from the beginning has been very like very exacting, but also very unprecious about these movies. Like the second Evil Dead movie basically retells the first movie <laughs> in a slightly different way in the first 10 or 15 right. minutes so that it can set up things that it wants to do. And then the third movie again goes back and Actually, Evil Dead might even spend more, like half of its runtime, kind of recapping the first movie and then adding a little on to the end. Whereas the then Army of Darkness kind of recaps Evil Dead 2 in the first <laughs> 10 or 15 minutes in a slightly different way to set up the events of that movie. Um, then we next got the the um the 2013 film that was the next thing that happened and th that movie has a tease at the end that teases bruce campbell even though the tones are different but not really if we look at what we're talking about which is the evil dead movies you mentioned it the kind of mean-spiritedness um of the of the evil force like my son came in and was looking at the trailer for the new evil dead movie with me and he likes horror and he said what i like the evil dead movies and i said i think you would and i i said what sets it apart is it's like a possession thing it's kind of like zombies meets possession, but the but the creatures are are really mean and can like when right when you're about to strike them down, they go back to pretending they're the, your loved one. Yeah, and they'll yeah, like yeah, cry yeah. and beg for you not so to kill mean, them. Man. And then when you notice that they're you know, then if you call them on their bluff or whatever, they say something mean about you, or, you know, whatever, or just something that's like personal and kind of embarrassing and like humiliating. It's it's like it's very yeah nasty. And I think that like I've read that the director of this who said that people are already talking about how this looks like it doesn't have the trademark humor of the franchise well neither did the 2013 film in the same way but he said he thinks there's a little humor in the in the extremeness and the meanness of the yeah. evil dead characters and i think that more so than funny what i think marks those sam raimi movies is just how much they go for it and i think that's what really is the thing that makes an evil dead movie is that like i mean outside of the specifics of i think we are going to have another they find the book they, they say the words there's some of that in this movie but like ultimately it's the fact that it just goes so hard <laughs> into yeah. those those gore elements those body horror elements those uh turning friends against each other elements the body count is usually pretty high compared to the you know whatever the relative number of characters moving it to an urban setting moving it to a high rise where it's kind of claustrophobic also there's some stuff on a lake um and it seems like it's highly personalized it might be like a particular kind of almost villain that this movie has if we have this one woman who seems to be a prominently possessed person in this. So I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of ways to add to the mythology of evil dead by just doing a little something new, a little something different. That's the kind of franchise that it is. That's what makes it so fun. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, I love all the movies and I'm totally on board. <laughs> it's like, I don't, I don't want it to look like Sam Raimi made it. I just yeah. kind of need to know that Sam Raimi uh, put his stamp of approval on it, which is definitely, definitely. the case, you know? Yeah, no, this looks, <clears throat> this looks great. I mean, I think also just like an idea, I mean, there's been a lot of negative press around, you know, the whole like, I don't know, debacle over it, like Warner Discovery and HBO Max and everything. But, you know, it's important to keep in mind that this was one that was supposed to be an HBO Max, you know, direct to HBO Max streaming film. So, you know, I don't know if that says more about their priorities in terms of what they're putting out in theaters versus the streaming service. But, you know, I think there's probably um, a bit of confidence also in the movie, you know, to be able to say, well, well this is going to go theatrical. It's like, I think one of only two, two or three of their titles that were set for streaming that they changed course on and, um, you know, changed it to a theatrical release instead. So I think that that probably bodes well for the movie and for the audience. I think that there's probably some confidence in it. And I, I've read that uh, from a couple people that I have a lot of trust in that, you know, testing and some, you know, things like that, that it's, it sounds like it's going to be pretty good. Um, 
Plus, the the fans, that- of, fans of the original Sam Raimi movies, mm-hmm. I just wanted to say, there's three seasons of Ash versus Evil Dead to enjoy. And that stuff is pretty darn strong and actually gives that character sort of a, uh, a nice ending if we never see him again. But I feel like mm-hmm. the door is always open for them to find some way to, to you know, crash those worlds together it just right now feels like this is like you guys said this is going at a different tone and I, you know i kind of want that i don't want them to be repeat if the whole point is that it's original and fresh you can't repeat the same thing yeah. every time yeah. So. yeah uh the other one that came out we wanted to mention real quick uh we finally got to take a, a look at nicholas cage as dracula in uh chris mckay's renfield so we, we're recording this on thursday and it just came out earlier today um but this is a uh, yeah Nicholas Cage, uh, Aquafina, uh, Nicholas Holt, uh, Ben Schwartz is in it. Um, a couple yeah. other names I, I recognized when I was reading the 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 trailer posting. But yeah, I mean this again, this too. I mean, there's like a lot of fun around this idea of Nick Cage playing Dracula, and he's kind of had, you know, I think after like Pig and the you know um massive talent and you know he's kind of got like a bit of an upswing right now in terms of more like studio fare and kind of getting into more of a mainstream stuff so this definitely seems a lot more it's still playing in the genre and it looks kind of like you know it looks fun it looks it looks yeah. you know that's the thing i keep thinking about watching the trailer a couple of times it just looks like I don't know why, but like the tone of it a little bit kind of reminded me of just like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, like the movie, <laughs> yeah, almost. not the series. Um, but yeah, I don't know, just the idea of, you know, a of Renfield, you know, kind of wanting to break from Dracula and go into like a support group for it yeah. is kind of just a fun uh, framing device for the trailer. And then to kind of see a little taste of, you know, what what's going to go across in the film. Um, and I mean, we'll talk about it later, but even just, you know, seeing Nic- Nicholas Holt recently in the menu. Um, I definitely feel like he's one of those actors that I, I'm, I'm intrigued to see him in pretty much anything he does. So yes. um, to kind of see him as the star of this with Nicolas Cage, uh, this is another trailer that I was like, yeah, I'm in. I'm in for this one for sure. What, what did you think of this one, John? Um, you know, I, the meanest thing I saw was someone said, I didn't know they rebooted what we do in the shadows already. Um, right. Or that. Yeah, true. But I also think that there's fun to be had with this concept and there's fun to be had even mm that that show can't lay claim as, as brilliant and groundbreaking in some ways as that show can be. I don't think that it's, it's the first time people have made jokes about, you know, uh, like monsters and, and yeah, Dracula yeah, yeah. and like what the social, whatever would be of that. I do think that like, it makes you think of that and then you kind of get past it because you realize, well, this is dealing with Dracula and this is dealing with Renfield and this is de- dealing with like these iconic characters and presumably will be a one and done, or, you know, maybe they're trying to kick something off with this, but I just right. mean, this is a story. This is a movie. This is not, this is, I, I I would be willing to bet that Chris McKay, who's like a sharp comedy director um, and was, was responsible, I think for the Lego Batman movie. Yeah, he was. Yeah. That was his. I mean, that movie's great. It's great um, and yeah. kind of, I, I would say it's underrated, except everybody that seems to see it uh, has agreed. It's one of the better Batman movies <laughs> in, a, in a way. <laughs> um, but I think that like, I just feel like he's, he's smart and funny. So I expect him to understand that he is stepping into a world that's had four seasons of what we do in the shadows already. Um, uh, even though, you know, obviously this movie has been in the works for a little while. So I don't know. I, I, yeah, I thought the trailer was funny. And I think if you're going down that road of like Nicolas Cage, like checking things off, yeah. um, this is clearly something he had on his list. It was like, I, I sure. get to play Dracula. You know, he wants <laughs> to be like Count Chocula for us. And I think that's yeah. wonderful. So, so bring it on. And it's April. So that's, those are two April movies actually that, uh, you know, like something to look forward to. <clears throat> yeah. what do you think, Ron? It looks fun. I mean, I, yeah. That's all I was thinking. I, I mean, you guys watched me watch it in silence. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Yes. I really am excited to see Nicolas Cage. Like he makes me happy, man. Like, yeah, yeah. I like he, watching him. You're right. Yeah, he's he, he does something that not a lot of people do. So, like, this, this is a weird comparison because this 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 is all the way on the other scale. Tom Tom Cruise makes me very happy when I see him on screen. And it's just because it's like there's a fight in him that you don't see people have at his age when acting. It's like, I still want to be good. I still want to be interesting. I still want to be crazy. I'm still living like this, this serving this kid that's in his chest, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Nicolas Cage does that. <clears throat> it's like, it's so fun to see. He's, he's like, yeah, I'm going to kill him with this terrible accent that i'm gonna do and it's it's 
He doesn't care. He he knows it's going to well, be fun. He, he wants to suck your blood. That's yeah. why. It's so fun, man. So I'm ready. You know, when, when you said you were going to make, he reminded you of another actor, I actually jotted down because I was like, I want to see if I know which actor because Nicolas Cage makes me think of another actor, Keanu, in a way. Ooh, like Keanu okay. hasn't had the same kind of money troubles that Nicolas Cage has had. And there's not as much like, oh, he'll take any role because he needs to keep the lights on. Yeah, right. But I think that they both have the kind of long career where they at different times have been considered like schlocky or not great. And they are currently in a zone of you like watching them have fun. And yes. if they said Keanu Reeves was playing Dracula in this movie, I think we would be having roughly the same conversation about how fun <laughs> it's going to be to watch him ham it up. And in fact, thinking about his history with the the Dracula character, uh, it would be especially funny to see him play it now. But I think that yeah. there's certain actors that they get to a point where just the fact that they're still around yeah. um, and they're still, like you said, Ronald Scrappy, taking on parts and, and clearly like having fun doing what they're doing. I think that's... Uh, you know, like it's whatever that sad period where Nicolas Cage was in a bunch of anonymous movies and that was what was happening because he was taking every role. Now I feel like he's doing a, like the fun version of that where he pops yeah. up, you know, everything from like uh, his Adam West riff in um, Kick-Ass, which is like this kind of part where it's like watching him play Batman, basically, but a twisted Batman. I think it's right. fun to see him say, well, now you're going to get my you're going to get my Drac, my Drac. <clears throat> <laughs> Anything yeah, else coming up that we want to mention before we get to uh there's a big party I want to invite you guys to over at uh um <laughs> what Ted the Tycoon Ferguson's yeah, house? Yeah. Now yeah. expect the telegram uh, any minute. <laughs> okay, so this movie is a 1989 movie that actually didn't come out in this in the states until 1992 because oh, wow. it was considered sort of taboo and and you know, I, if you've seen it you kind of might understand why. It is hard to imagine like the MPAA rating this film in a strange way like mm -hmm. it's hard to imagine someone approaching this movie in any way yeah, uh, yeah. but um yeah a society uh directed by and i hope i'm pronouncing his name right brian yuzna who um is also uh a producer on uh, reanimator and i think one of the ways he got this movie budgeted was he owned the sequel rights to reanimator and he agreed to do that if they would fund this movie. I hope I'm okay. not mangling that story, but I mean, this is an oddball film. This is an outlier, even for its time. I heard an interesting interview with the director uh, where he said that he thinks that now audiences are reclaiming this movie because they watch it and they think it's just the eighties. Like they just go everything that looks is cheap and schlocky about it. People are yeah. forgiving of it because it's just like, Oh, the eighties. And even I yeah. found myself in the first 15 or 20 minutes being nostalgic, like just the haircuts and the outfits and the fact that it's shot on film and the lighting, yeah. it just felt like, Oh, this is a nostalgia blast. And then of course it, is what it is but he said that he thinks that audiences in 1989 and 92 saw it as schlocky and weird and now people are seeing it as like a product of its time more which i think there is some truth to that that modern i know that my son will sometimes watch an old movie he doesn't have the context for whether it was corny at the time or whether it just looks corny because it's old yeah, but right. um this movie is hard to imagine and then the other thing the director said and i guess i'll throw this to you at this point um he also said he doesn't think and this is an odd choice of words he said this is not a seminal film um, I thought that was slightly ironic, but what he meant was uh, it was a standalone movie that it didn't influence a lot of movies that came after it. It does have like cult status, yeah. but it's more like cult status. You hear about it, you hear about how effed up it is, and then you feel like you need to watch it. I mean, if you're a film fan or a horror fan, I'm, right. this was looming out there for me to check out. So this is the first time I'd watched it. Um, I definitely have some reactions, but I'd love to know just off the cuff, Ronald, maybe we'll start with you. What did, how did you feel? Maybe talk about the range of feelings you went through while watching uh, 1989 or 1992's society. Okay. So I've heard people talk about things that they imagine wealthy people do in barbershops and bars. Like it's like a conversation I used to hear as a kid. And one that I used to hear in barbershops. It's like the 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 like all encompassing. This is what rich people do. This is the Illuminati. And I wonder to to the point where I wonder <laughs> if it's based. These thoughts are based on this movie. Like if like one person saw it, it's like man, you know what? They just fuck each other and then people come out of assholes and they start eating each other. It's like. <laughs> it, it's it's that that's the whole of, review of the movie right there yes. you it's that kind mm. of you don't weird. hear stories like that in supercuts ronald <laughs> no 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 but uh i can take you to a couple barbershops where they'll tell you what ri that rich people do these sorts of things and and that's that's why it didn't seem so odd to me yeah. like watching it and being like oh i've heard someone say this before right. 
This is what people do, rich people do. Uh, but practical effect, man, I, 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 whatever this movie is, whatever style of acting this is, it's like heightened, even for its time, wasn't normal. No, it's, it's like, very much like it. That's something that I would want to say to anybody watching it now. Like, even if you watched it at the time, you would have caught it. But especially now, they are doing something. I don't know if all the actors are in control of that, but the yeah. ones who are, they're definitely doing a more heightened kind of satirical tone. I think Bill, Billy Warlock is an interesting case of like, what is his acting style beyond this? I mean, he comes off Baywatch onto this. So it's like, we're not expecting like him to be a great thespian, but he does fulfill the role of yeah. what what Bill Whitney uh, Whitley needs to be in this movie. Um, I heard someone say that it's one of those rare cases where the actor's name is more of a movie name than the character's name. He should just be Billy <laughs> yeah. Warlock in every movie that yes. he does. It was odd, man. It was an odd movie, but... I'm really glad that I watched it, to be completely honest with you. Like, I'd always seen that. Co- I remember that cover after I told yeah. you that I kind of mm-hmm. hadn't seen it before. I I remember walking into uh, a video store and seeing it, seeing that picture. Like, it's very distinct, you know. The the But the practical effects were incredible, man. Like, I, I loved that they exist. Everything looked wet and disgusting and bloody and yeah would you yeah, think the effects the effects are by screaming mad george we should just mention who had a oh. pretty interesting career um and did like uh famously uh i'm trying to think of what other things you might know the cockroach scene in nightmare on elm street 4 was the work of screaming oh wow mad george um but lots of films from that era had effects either entirely by them or uh you know like a sequence and often it would be this kind of thing gross slimy uh yeah. body horror type stuff <laughs> wow steve what'd you think you know, honestly, like I, I mentioned last time, I, I you, you're you right. I, I think I said the same thing in terms of the, the box art for this was always one that I remember seeing when I worked at like a, I had a couple different video store jobs, like, you know, local store and like Hollywood video. And it was always one of those ones like, you know, that kind of benefited from an interesting box art. You know, people would grab it for that reason. And a couple of friends had recommended it to me. And I remember watching it like in the late 90s. I remember watching it um, when I was in high school. And I didn't really remember much of it until I, you know, rewatching it, it kind of, a lot of it came back. And honestly, you, you, it's funny you mentioned the Billy Warlock of it all, because like, I remember like he he like stood out to me for some reason, uh, <laughs> like I think from Baywatch, like having yeah. watched Baywatch and and this movie and then another movie that um, uh, I remember watching a ton uh, when I was younger. But yeah, I, I didn't remember a ton of the movie itself. Um, a couple key scenes kind of stood out in my memory. You remember yeah, the shunting, probably. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I, I don't know. Like, it's just it's it's weird though, because I I feel like I felt the same way then. Like, this is another one of those kinds of horror movies that is just maybe not my thing. Uh, yeah. But yeah, the things that stand out really like are the practical effects and kind of just like how just off the rails the movie goes. Yeah. But one thing I I remember thinking, you know, when I was rewatching it a couple like a week or so ago, which, a couple weeks ago, was like. It's one of those examples that like as how to say this, like as crazy as the movie gets and is like the main character, like the way he's reacting to it all yeah. is like the way you would react to it all. Yeah. You know, like I feel like in some horror movies or, you know, thrillers, whatever it is, like the reactions to the things that you're presented with, like a lot of things would be dismissed or like excused or they would write something off. Or, you know, like there's a lot of like convincing yourself that you're not seeing what you're seeing. Or you're, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. I feel like that is one thing I do like a lot about the movie is that like for all the craziness and just absurdity that happens in this kind of body horror uh, movie, his character like is calling it as it is like the whole movie, yeah. you know, or even when he's faced with like people telling him that he's not seeing what he's seeing or that, that there's nothing there, like everything that he questions is like, a valid thing to question <laughs> and yeah. he's not like convincing himself that it's not what he's looking at or you know you know what i mean like i, I, I know, know exactly what you mean i think yeah. about that in horror stories a lot and how i think that it's like being on the road anybody going faster than you is a maniac and anybody going slower than you is an idiot and in, in a right. movie, anybody who's acting more gullible than you is an idiot and and anybody who's less gullible <laughs> than you is a maniac but i think that there is this weird thing that's like um 
I mean, his his acting style, I was trying to place it, like what it was making me of, and it was definitely kind of of its time. And I realized yeah, yeah. he's got like, it's like a John Stamos look, but with like big Emilio Estevez energy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and maybe even a little bit of like Michael J. Fox voice. Like he's doing a little bit of this kind he's of got, voice. That's, that's it. He's got that Michael J. Fox kind of like inflection when he's talking. But he's like a little guy. Like and yeah, he looks yeah. very small next to people. And I had heard yeah. somewhere that he's David like, Hasselhoff. That, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, come on, guy. We gotta yeah, like, go. Come on, man. Yeah. Damn, yeah. Let's go. But it's like that's Billy Warlock's character. And you're right. He does sort of ground the movie in this very strange way, even though there are times where he's like walking along and he's actually kind of walk walking yeah. like this. Like he's sort of a doof in some ways. And it's right, it's really not clear to me how much he knew. And I think he's said as much that he he didn't know at the time what kind of movie they were making, but that he now kind of appreciates it. But I think what you're saying, Steve, actually makes some of the more unsettling parts of the movie play. Like when they yeah. get him at towards the end and they've got they've snared his neck. I mean, we should just say it's basically the simple log line would be that this young man who's adopted um, views his adopted family kind of from a distance and doesn't feel like he's quite one of them. And then it becomes more and more the case when he discovers they're all part of this secret society that seems to be like basically rich people that are all aliens or ancient beings or something. Not, not, not aliens, but ancient beings who have a lineage that goes back through, who was it? Julius Caesar all the way to Genghis Khan or something yeah. like that. Like, I don't yeah. know if that makes sense or, or adds up. Um, but the idea that they hunt uh, poor people, uh, or just less advantaged people than themselves to um, uh, basically fist to death and then like pound massage into mush uh, and then like suck their life force up. And that's what they do. And they call it the shunting. <laughs> and Billy doesn't know until the end of the movie that this is like the fate they have lined up for him. We see it happen to poor Dave Blanchard. Um, Blanchard bursts into the house. I know. And he's yelling at them. And that's the thing. B Billy kind of roughs him up. Yeah. And then sends him back and, and then his parents are very like, didn't we tell you not to date Blanchard? Yeah, you're talking about like, the beginning where, where Dave Blanchard is like hiding in the closet, actually, and like watching his sister sh like get dressed. And it seems very yeah. creepy and, and still is pretty creepy. He but what he's trying house, to do is get proof that these are weird beings. Yeah. I mean, it, he roughs him up like it, it's yeah. in front of the parents and they are the calmest I've ever seen parents that A, a person is in their house, B, that their son be kind of shook up this man that's maybe a foot taller than him. Yeah. <laughs> and then he's trying to convince him. Why didn't you spit out what was wrong with him? Because he's like, hey, hey, I gotta tell you something. I gotta tell you. He's like, shut up. Well, I don't think up. he could say it in front of them. He's gotta prove it to he's gotta prove it to Billy, but he uses that tape to prove it. But I just wanted to uh, finish saying that that moment where Billy gets dragged into the party and he's getting thrown on the floor and stuff, like that's pretty unsettling. And the way they're all standing around and they're being so casual, it's just very yeah. creepy. Like and and I do think that that Billy Warlock somehow plays those scenes reasonably well. Like it's it's like that whole thing of he actually doesn't mind being at a loss. But yeah. um, but yeah, earlier in the movie, it's interesting how Dave. Do you remember how he does get him to believe him as he, he takes him out to the beach <laughs> yes. and he plays him that that micro cassette recorder? I actually recorded a bit of dialogue that I thought was funny, and I just I just wanted to say okay. this is this is the kind of I hope it'll play. If not, we can drop this audio in. Um, do I have that? Is it like this? Okay, yes. So I hope this will be audible. Wow, your boobs are totally sexy. You guys are gonna pop high ones. Wow, your boobs are totally sexy. Guys are gonna pop high ones as soon as they yes! see you. <laughs> I that was such that weird one. dialogue, but what it reminded me of when I was like in 12th grade, not 12th grade, when I was 12 years old, I had a friend, this was in three way, it was kind of a new thing. I had a friend who would call me up and he would kind of not bully me, but he would kind of cajole me into calling like sex lines and we would listen to these sex lines. And I at 12 had no, I, it was just weird, but the, but that's what the women sounded like. They were like, oh, he's got a hot rod. Oh, I'm, let me put my fingers around it. Mm, get those pants off, buddy. I mean, it was just these weird things that no one really says. But when I heard that scene, it was like, man, this is because it kind of sounds like people that don't know. You're what, having like, flashbacks. I was having flashbacks <laughs> to getting in trouble for that phone bill. You yeah, know, I bet. Um, when I was when they I was twelve. But, but, but like not knowing why it was like not getting like not being old enough to even understand why it right. was supposed to be good or arousing. It was just weird to listen to that stuff. But I felt like that the that was the way those that scene sounded to me but yeah it was pretty interesting i i the, you know the sexuality in this movie is extremely graphic and very like there's a lot of incest and there's just 
I mean, yeah. once you get into like the physical transformations later, it's one of the more graphic films I've seen in terms of that stuff. I think it's only kept from being like truly horrific by the fact that, uh, as you were saying, Ronald, like the the practical effects, the prosthetics are very stylized and yeah. almost like Beetlejuice ask uh, as far as like stretching faces and that kind of thing it's a little cartoony and that keeps it from being in fact at one point it's very cartoony a guy actually goes blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but but it does pay off i think that's the thing if this is a movie that you're watching because you heard it was screwed up and there's a crazy last act it, it like uh, nikki was Hold walking on. in and out being like what is this 90210 shit that john is watching and she kept saying stuff like you're making ronald and steve watch this <laughs> <laughs> such a crazy movie but then when she luckily was in the room when things went crazy and she sat there transfixed for the next 25 minutes and will never be the same i don't think um yeah it, and that's where nikki changed yeah right <laughs> what about when milo is it milo when milo is his friend yeah yeah he milo. comes even is he the nerdy guy who's the nerdy guy nerdy guy is petri who okay, is like when petri <laughs> supposedly dies yeah and then he comes to the event and they're like he's like i thought you died everybody's laughing at him and he goes like this <laughs> like <laughs> like his throat wasn't slit but he's referencing his neck like like he like he pieced it together or something. It's just a very weird scene. It just I I I couldn't get over that sort of thing, that sort of stuff. It was like the little I'm like, why are they acting like this about this thing? I the the over the top stuff makes sense to me because they're like, we're going for crazy. But it was a subtle shit like that. That was like, why is everybody reacting like well, this? Well, I liked that even Milo was like, I really thought we were just playing a joke. I mean, even though what Milo's doing to him, apparently he's been the one hiding that Ken doll in the car and all that shit. And yeah. Then the, the, but like Maybe when he's like, I didn't know you would react like this. I thought that was kind of funny. It's like you weren't supposed to get up in front of the school and have like a crazy <laughs> rant. You were just supposed to. But it's still like, what did you think he was going to do? I thought yeah. I liked the earlier debate between him and Petrie where – um. It was basically like Petrie was it was the Hillary Clinton effect where Petrie insulted the crowd. Uh, and and then uh, and then Billy basically turns to him in a very Trumpy way. He says, like, looks like you just just lost the moron vote, you know, and I yes. thought that was a very, very prescient moment. But what what did what did he say? He said something like um, he accused Billy uh, of using his athletic ability to appeal to the morons in the audience or something like yes. that. And then it was like, you could tell the crowd turned against him. And that's when I noticed, and this is another funny thing. Did you notice that whenever they showed shots of characters in the crowd, it was like a differently framed type of shot of like the front two rows of the auditorium or mm. an auditorium. But whenever they cut to a wide shot, it was like they just went to a school auditorium that was full of kids and got like some like B-roll because yeah. the kids are just kind of reacting, but they don't seem to, like they're not necessarily reacting to what we're seeing. I thought that was kind of funny, but I think in a low budget movie, you probably do what you can. Yeah, um, just get some patch over those holes. Do do some do some takes where you're yelling, do some takes where you're laughing, and it just kind of yeah. Like, you're happy, yeah. you're sad, you like yeah. it, you don't. You're right. It did seem kind of weird because they they were framed so differently. It 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 just didn't even yeah. That damn. But uh, yeah. What a weird movie. I'm glad I watched it though. I mean, like it's not my it's not my cup of tea, but I'm glad I had it some exposure to society, which they repeated constantly yes. in the movie. It, to the point where I was trying to get what they were getting at. Like I was like, it's is right. this supposed to be fake deep? Like I, I can't figure out if it's like felt a little you know, heavy-handed. I, I liked some of that though, not necessarily the repetition of the word society, but I liked some of the these people are weird and they just say weird things. Like the 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 girlfriend Clarissa said weird things to him. Like at one point she said, You're so fresh, which <laughs> felt weird. And then she also said something to him about like, well, she, one thing she said that was weird is when they were getting undressed, she said, uh, lean machine, jelly bean, which yes. is a very strange thing to say to anybody. Strange. Was that um was that supposed to be an indication that she wasn't? Normal. Maybe, maybe. I mean, we know that she's got the twisty. She's got. She can put her butt in the front or whatever. <laughs> so yeah. it's like, we know, we know that she's one of them. But she's like in love. Front can, butt. Yeah, she's an old front butt. Front but butt. She's, <laughs> but she's in love Good with old um, front butt. 
but she's in love with Billy, right? So in the end, she's kind of like redeemed by that. And she doesn't really seem like she's into all the shunting when it's going on. Right, right, right. Um, right. But it, it it isn't quite clear. Like in her mom, I thought her mom was just her own weird oddball person who ate hair and coughed up hairballs. But apparently that's something that the shunters do too. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, there's unanswered questions for sure. <laughs> because it was like, they, they he was going to have sex with her. And then his, her mother comes in like, I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> Did you notice every time the mother was there, the the the, the score went like boom, 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 boom. There was like a little music cue that came up. Oh, one other odd little thing. I don't mean to just. I mean, you can look at a movie like this, and like you don't want to necessarily pick on all the signs that it was a low budget movie. But there was one really weird edit when Billy's about to leave the party. He's like, she's like, run, Billy, and he runs for the door, and then they grab him and throw him back down, and then the next shot is like a dark stairwell, and he's running up the stairwell. He somehow, it's, I think that just means they didn't get a scene they needed, or they had to patch something together. Mm. But there's this really weird edit where it seems like they have him in a well lit room, and there's like twenty of them, and then somehow he's he's in a dark hallway all by himself. But uh, oh, um, you know, you got to give a movie credit for just throwing an edit like that in there, and not <laughs> not doing anything to explain it. Oh boy. I will wow. say this. I, I did read the credits because I wanted to see that the song is like the Eaton, I think it's Eaton, the fight song for, for Eaton, uh, the school, that they rewrote those words to that are about society. And if you look at the lyrics to the song that they're singing in the opening and the closing, they're like, it sounds like a college fight song, but it's got these weird lyrics that apply to the, the ancient society of, of oh, the film. Wow. And the other thing I noticed in the credits are the two best names of all time. Uh, in the special thanks, Flip Blimstein and Blanche Blimstein. <laughs> Good old Flip and Blanche <laughs> down the street in the club. And in, in, in summation, I, the director Brian Yustin has this great quote that I listened to. I listened to the you know the projection booth that podcast. Yeah, that they had an episode about this, and I listened to some of that. And the director said, and I just love this. He said when he was making it, he was trying to make such a good movie, and he thought it was going to. Um, I'd be number one at the box office. And then he kind of pauses and he says, but then again, I was delusional. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Yikes. That's a crazy. <laughs> at least but I, mean, I, I, th I think you have to make, though, a movie. I don't know. You have to kind of be up in your own head to make a movie like this. And yeah, I know what you mean, Ron. Sure. It's not my cup of tea either from beginning to end, but I am glad I saw it. And I am glad that a movie like this exists because it is so different, even from all the all the oddball movies you might watch from this era this one kind of stands on its own mm -hmm. on its own weird wobbly jelly vaseline legs and i think that's uh you know that's special cool well, whose turn is it now <laughs> i think it's my turn all right um so i turn required viewing into required viewing for myself sometimes because yes there are movies that I just have not seen in my life. And there's a trilogy I haven't seen, but I want to watch the first of them. Uh, the Godfather. I have never seen the Godfather trilogy. Oh, wow. In my life. I'd like to see the first one. So that is our required viewing. I've never, like, I've only watched the first, like, 10 minutes of it. I've never watched the entire movie. When people quote it, I have no, I, I have a blank face all the time. And yeah, it's. To the point where, like, people think I'm fucking with them. I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, you just don't, you can't refuse. I'm like, what? What the fuck is that from? What? What is that? Yeah. So. No, that's great. I would. I, I actually, uh, uh, Henry's been asking about watching those movies. So this will be a great oh, wow. uh, chance okay. to sit down and watch that. So we'll have to find, like, the what? who's got, like, the prettiest, uh, you know, transfer of this out there? Ron, I have, you're the guy who usually knows that. I have the, I have the remasters. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, I think I have a month. One of my hard drives crashed, so I have to figure. I have to figure that out. But I'll put one up. I I don't have access to it. All right. Um, but but yeah. I mean, it's like that's yeah, that's one that's. I mean, it's one of those where it's like you watch it and you go, "Oh yeah." It's like when you read that great book and you go, "Oh, this is a classic because it's great, not because right, right. people are dum dums," you know. <laughs> right. For sure. For sure. Cool. Cool. You know, th then Steve, the challenge is on you whether you make us watch godfather 2 next because that would be then right. put the pressure on me to make us watch godfather 3 <laughs> we'll see what he thinks of the first one yeah yeah that's true yeah what if you hate it ronald that would be not... <laughs> there's so many people that would be disappointed in me but i'm okay with taking a hot take like that if i yeah, didn't man, like yeah. it I'll... you do you boo you just yeah. do you okay okay all the <laughs> listeners will be popping high ones if you come in with a hot take on the godfather <laughs> the I was popping high ones. <laughs> 
That's nuts, man. All right. So the menu, I saw this. I already yeah, talked a little it. bit about yeah. it uh, on the show. I, I'll reiterate my thoughts later, but yeah, you guys have freshly seen it. Start off with your thoughts, maybe, Steve. What did you think of Le Menu? I, I really liked it. Um, I, I really didn't know a whole lot about it. I remember seeing maybe, I don't even think I said the whole trailer um, in the time between its theatrical release and you know coming out here, but... I had heard a, a few friends of mine had seen it. John, you mentioned it on the podcast. Um, definitely was interested in seeing it. It kind of had that vibe and of uh, what was that one movie that came out like right at the beginning of the pandemic? Um, Invitation? No, a little bit of that. But I was thinking of the hunt. Yeah, like whoa, 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 like this whoa, whoa. idea oh, yeah, of yeah, 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 you know yeah, yeah. what what's going wrong uh, to to like throw this little visit to this island restaurant tasting yeah. getaway thing uh awry but yeah i don't know like i i, I love, love the cast is great um and I, you know i gotta say also like maybe i'll mention it at the end of the episode but seeing john leguizamo in two movies in one week i watched a violent night or, or earlier in the week um just kind of seeing him twice in a week was a pleasant thing for me because i've always been a big fan of his yeah, give um, us a quick uh ritz on uh on that yeah seen dude that. I was... violent night is so fun okay, i cool. heard yeah, it's, you got to watch it. Like, okay, it's, that makes me happy. I mean, like holiday movie, tons of movie references, like okay, cool. you know, to Christmas movie references. David Harbour's having a blast. Leguizamo is just chewing scenery as the villain of the movie. Uh, uh, who else? Beverly D'Angelo is in it. was chewing some scenery in this one, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Weird, huh? <laughs> um, who would have thought? Yeah. It's just yeah. really fun. I, I I thought it was really fun. It's just it's just one of those just really fun, quick genre hits. And anything that's like a holiday mashup with a genre, it's like, let's yeah. mix up a Christmas movie with an action movie or a horror movie or whatever. I'm in. And yeah. it's, it's gets pretty gro gory and it's just, it's, it's just a lot of fun. Yeah. So it Violent looks like Night, it knows what yeah. it is, which is absolutely all I want. And a surprise hit too with theaters. Yeah. It's still playing in theaters, but it's available digitally now too. Um, but yeah, that's sidestepping that. But that you, you, was really You know what? You know, one of the reasons why people love david harbour he's he i mean i think in the right, i mean he, in the he, right situation he's a star i really think he's a draw he, he he is and i think for this kind of thing word of mouth was really good on it and it got it got really good reviews and it's it's just yeah it's solid man it's it, i really enjoyed it um but yeah so back but yeah back to the menu yeah. I, just, just to mention yeah i haven't seen a ton of john leguizamo recently i mean he voiced the character in encanto a couple years ago but I mean, like, I just love seeing that guy in anything. And he's really fun in the menu. Really, everyone that you would recognize from, you know, prior movies, TV shows in this that pops up is, is really great. Um, Ray Fiennes is is great as like, I guess, the head chef that the kind of thing all revolves around. But, um, you know, it's another one of those things where it's like it's got that mean streak in it. And I don't know that it all like fully worked for me as a whole. Um, uh, but you know, with some of the characterizations and, and where some of those storylines went, but the idea of what this group of chefs or this, this compound is doing uh, during this, during this tasting event that we are watching in the movie, um, what their motivations are and um, what some of the characters who are participating in the tasting, what their motivations are, I found really interesting. And, you know, I, I, I like a lot of what Mark Malad's doing, you know, obviously the most people know him from succession, um, and in his role there, but there's a lot of commentary and just conversations about, you know, you mentioned like even just briefly with society and, you know, talking about the menu and even what we'll talk about with glass onion in a bit here, just the ideas of like the have and have nots and, you know, what, what some of this, uh, gazing at different, uh, industries or talents or skills, like what it does actually change, uh, the perspective of those who possess those skills and, you know, it kind of changes their careers and their and, and, and not to condone anything that happens in this movie, obviously. But there is something to be said for, you know, the, the shift in perspective that one can take when, you know, their skill set or their career choice is, you know, kind of mirrored through the lens of like a food critic or, you know, the impact that has on it or, you know, just these people that are just so privileged mm. um, and what they think they can do and dictate um <laughs> around you know your your life's path i don't know and i don't, I don't want to again i feel like i'm glorifying some of this horrible shit that happens in this movie 
but there is there is some interesting conversation around the motivation of what what happens in this movie. Uh, but yeah, well, I, I, would I say really even like because the Ray Fine character, who you might say is kind of the the pivot point character, right. there's 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 something very hypocritical in a way. Yes, a, about about him, but maybe not necessarily the yeah the class. I don't know. Yeah. Ronald, what did you think? And and like, what did you think about that particular issue? How this movie kind of takes on this sort of there's a message or there's something percolating in there that's trying to be a message. Um, <clears throat> uh, when I first started dating my wife, um, I noticed that she tipped. Um, it's just a it's a subtle thing that makes all the difference in the world and just how she views the service industry. Um, mm -hmm. I've noticed just in my past couple of years just being an adult and being able to afford more things you go to nicer restaurants and um i'm there for i'm there for everything the sounds the sights the tastes but i, I the really, smells yeah the smells the smells as well i don't know why i forgot the yeah. smells <laughs> he left this one of the best ones out but yeah i don't know i forgot <laughs> the smells uh but yeah there, there's just something about what that what that entails um and the deep appreciation that I have for it. Now I could I, I've I've in the past, especially when I was in DC, it happened so much in DC. I took I took my I took my wife to a Michelin star place. I'd never been to a Michelin star restaurant. It was uh 10 courses and then a accompanying sake with it for each sushi piece. I I talked to somebody that uh had been there before and they were just like it's 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 bullshit and the people are and i was like oh this is that thing that thing where like you don't you don't appreciate anything about this it doesn't mean anything to you that these people are doing anything it doesn't mean anything to you that these people try hard to create a, a spectacular ambiance or it just is lost from by some people and that commentary i mean the reaction that they have to this is uh, very extreme, but I get as artists, we should really understand some aspect of how somebody could be pushed to the point where, you know, this is career ruining stuff. If it's, if it comes out in the, in, in, in the right way, you know, it, oh, the wrong yeah. way. I said, I guess the wrong way. Um, but it, it hit me hard mostly because, I just want to be, I think I'd rather, if, if something was not good to me, I'd rather not talk about it. I don't want to mm -hmm. ruin anybody's life. It would have to be like, somebody would have to like essentially slap me in the face and like, you don't understand this food. Then I'd be like, man, I was slapped and this person called me a bitch. <laughs> but it takes a lot for me to want to do something like that. And And for some people, it's just, they'll ruin somebody's life in a second. That yeah. that commentary is really, really important. Even if it comes in the form of this movie, I think that somebody can take from this, man, maybe I should be nicer to people. Maybe I should take things in a little differently. It's a weird thing. I didn't think that I'd come away from this movie thinking, <laughs> thinking that. But, but I really was like, holy shit, maybe... It, it 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 had something to say. It wasn't it wasn't the neatest way to say it. It was, I feel like the resolution wasn't the best. But okay, well, that, well, that, yeah, that gets at my issues with it. But go ahead and finish your thought. Yeah, <clears throat> there, it wasn't it wasn't. I'm okay with it though. Like if it, it succeeded in the most important part, which was kind of being like, don't be an asshole. <laughs> don't be an asshole. This can actually ruin somebody's whole life. Um, the rest of it resolved itself in a really weird way that I'm, I was kind of dissatisfied with, but there are more moments that I loved and hated. And for that's like an album. If I get an album with 12 tracks, if there's four of them that I listen to for the rest of my life, I've won. That album's good to me. <laughs> it's a weird thing to say, but like four things that you listen to forever. I kind of feel like that about movies. If I feel like if I come out of it with more love than hate, I'm pretty, I'm pretty good on it. So yeah. I, I enjoyed it. I mean, I, I think I've always had that feeling too of like generally, and again, we've talked about this on this show. We, we generally accentuate the positive. Um, yeah. Like yeah. For sure. we stopped doing worst of episodes a long time ago. Um, 
uh, for some of the reason you're mentioning that it almost feels like a waste of energy to, to just be negative. It's one thing to say, we're going to talk about a movie and our feelings are going to come out. It's another thing to single out. Like these are the ones yeah. that I, I found the shitty ones. No, I think that um, it's in that last act where the movie kind of lost me a little bit because up to that point, I felt like they were setting up things that the movie doesn't really mm. pay off. Like for instance, that moment where they say all the men can leave and they have this amount of time to escape. I thought that scene yeah. was going to lead to all kinds of weird little machinations and stuff going on, but instead they just kind of all get recaptured pretty quickly and they're <laughs> back in the same situation they were in before. Yeah. And then the last act of the movie where it's really making its big statement, it really requires all these characters to just sit there silently while they're, while they're basically, you know, what happens to them happens to them. And it's like, I just don't believe for a second that these people wouldn't have been fighting, scrambling for their lives right. up to the last right. second. It's like they accept their fate and just sit there for for what what's going on at the end of the movie. And I feel like that's when, I think what I said before is just like, that's when the desire to have a statement and have like almost like an art film uh, influence of you're, you're going for this grand almost absurd finale like the desire to have that message intact meant yeah. that they kind of left the characters and the story behind a little bit yeah. and um another movie i saw recently that i thought did a did a better job of the, almost the same ending um uh in a different way is uh the triangle of sadness i don't know if you guys have I seen see that yet. that movie mm -hmm. but it definitely deals with a similar scenario where you have the haves and the have not and yeah. the kind of clash and the way that movie ends is very much like i feel like that movie does more artfully what this movie is trying to do with its ending i think the other part of this movie that has nothing to do with that movie is the sort of delving into like the chef and the kind of foodie culture and that's where nicholas holt's character uh, comes in and i would say what happens with him is some of the most like that's like psychological horror of a sort yeah. that i think even the, there's a great visual punchline to it um with the little caption up on the screen uh, that comes up after he cooks his meal. But like, I thought yeah. that stuff was funny and sad and made me uncomfortable because I think in some ways we are that guy. We're the guy who would be like so excited to be there and you can't even be a fanboy in this situation and do it right. You know what I mean? Like Ray Fine is such a, a prickly guy that, that he doesn't even want fanboys like that. He wants, right, right. he wants people to sit back and enjoy the food. He doesn't want someone to come in and presume that they understand his art. Um, so yeah, he's, he's a kind of an asshole, but I think you're right. Ronald that you do sort of you, you side with him because he seems like he's a guy with an aesthetic um, and he's trying to put it forth and um, yeah I just wish that the movie had threaded the needle of like the last 15 20 minutes Sorry. because I think what it felt like it was leading up to was something a bit more like clever and involving all the characters which in a way might bring us to the conversation about uh, Glass Onion in a minute where right up to the last minute the fun is for me watching the the characters actually interact as characters and not like becoming symbols for for something <clears throat> yeah yeah. Steve, did you did you say what you thought? Did you? Yeah, I started yeah. it off. Yeah, you okay. What uh, was it? Uh, oh, uh, I do not know her name, man. Uh, Hong, Anya Taylor Joy. Hong Kwai. Hong. Oh yeah, Hong who Chow. plays Elsa in this? Hong Chao. Hong Chao. Hong Chao. Hong Chao. Uh, she was great. <laughs> She is she is taking over cinema and TV and I'm <laughs> she might have been my favorite part of the movie. I thought she was hilarious yeah, and and yeah, very memorable in this. I can't wait to see her in the whale. I heard she's incredible in the whale. I haven't seen that yet. I haven't seen it yet either. I heard she's she's really good in it. I'm buff, um, I'm afraid of the whale. I don't know. Me too. Uh, movies that sound just utterly miserable sound utterly miserable. <laughs> to I me. mean, we're not gonna act like that director makes nothing but no, sad movies, man. That's it's true. like really super sad movies. So like I'm I'm not looking forward to seeing it. But I am, but I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be sad for the rest of the night. <laughs> God damn it. <clears throat> so let's jump into Glass Onion. Yes, yeah. this is another one that I saw and spoke about briefly on the show. So I would love to hear you guys. Uh, what do you think of what do you think of the latest Benoit Blanc? Mr. A. Why don't, why don't you start this one off? It's no Knives Out. But that is to say it's no Back to the Future. It's no... <laughs> I know what you mean, but that, that those are strong words. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No, I know what you mean. A movie that kind of crystallized something. Yeah, and, it's like, yeah, it's, right. like it, yeah. it's a weird yeah. thing for... Like, I'm comparing... This is Back to the Future too. <laughs> yeah. It's... Yeah. 
I'm comparing a really good movie to a really good movie. And I will say this, man, like Janelle Monet, you motherfucker. <laughs> the 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 what everybody's doing in this movie, but particularly the chemistry between Janelle and um why can't I remember his name? Goddamn James Bond. Why can't I remember Daniel Craig? Yeah, Daniel Craig. Daniel like, Craig. I say, I say, Daniel I Craig, say, boy. The Buttress those feelings. Buttress those feelings. <laughs> I was not expecting him to it's say It's just it. dumb. <laughs> yeah. God you know, damn. what? Yeah. He's a meme. It's a meme factor. Let's just let's yeah, uh, the, the, the Benoit factory. Blanc phenomenon is strong. But yeah. I mean, I think what Ronald, what you're saying is true. The first one is going to be the best. Yeah. But I think we also all want like 19 Benoit Blanc movies. And not necessarily, but I just That's mean just keep it going and like bring keep it like, going. Have that kind of cast where everybody wants to show up. Even Yo Yo yeah. Mama wants to pop up at a party. Yeah. In the in the beginning, I loved that sort of like show busy, like fun. You felt like there was something. I don't know. I, I thought it was infectious. Like that's something that hit me in the first even yeah. moments of this movie was it felt like everybody showed up to have a blast. And I think that, you know, it, it really got me. Yeah. I place. want all the celebrity products. I want Jeremy Renner's hot sauce. I want, you know, it's, it's just like that. <laughs> yeah. Leto's, uh, uh, what was it? Spike kombucha. <laughs> yeah. I would have wanted the Kanye mural before a couple of months ago. It's just like, th this stuff is like, it's so weird and and like have, have you seen the promotional stuff for uh the glass onion have you seen some of it like I, I, they gave the actual puzzle oh yeah. out to puzzle people. box yeah man and the fact that it was near the same thing is is just the level of detail and him inviting the cast to actually play a game on an island like it's just that stuff that Ryan Johnson's doing is just—he's working on a different level. And the fact—I mean, he, he is—he's—he's he's, he is Ronald. That—that yeah. that is something you got to say. Ryan Johnson is like the, the reason. There's something going on with that guy that's just different, and yeah. like the what he's able to pull together with this, with with these movies is yeah. sort of like it's a mark of where he is in his career that he can like you know call <laughs> whoever it seems like, um, but also that he's putting that kind of thought into things. Yeah. Like to the point where, like, you know that meme of the the cartoon fist of Arthur. Quentin Tarantino has to be home. Like this motherfucker's dialogue is it's it's so good. It's like it doesn't necessarily feel like the most realistic, but it's like firing on all cylinders. Snappy, yeah, and it and it doesn't feel like one thing I love about good writing is when it doesn't feel like one person is writing for all these characters. They, they're they so unique in, in a very specific way. Like, mm -hmm. um, you know, I just I just love that. And then the twist that happens, I don't want to give anything away, kind yeah. of the twist that happens mid-movie when you realize that what the pieces that we've been working with may not be the pieces that we thought we were working with right. because of a series of events. Um, just is such a cool fucking thing. Like, oh... You thought you knew what was going on. And when there's something totally different going on, mm -hmm. I just, it's like a watch me, watch me work sort of thing. And I just love when good directors are able to kind of control things like that in a way that doesn't feel like accidental. Nothing's accidental. Everything counts. Every bit of dialogue makes matters. Um, I don't know, man. I I, I love this thing. And I'm pissed that it, it had a, it had such a limited time in the theater. Mm -hmm. I fucking wanted to go see it. I really wanted to go see it. And this should be a maybe a lesson to them for the next one that maybe this run should be a little longer in the theaters. What, what do you guys think about that? The run in the theaters. I mean, I wouldn't hold your breath, but I don't know. Yeah, probably. I, you know, like <laughs> Netflix wasn't going Netflix wasn't going to have ads either. And here we are. But yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I think Ryan Johnson pushing for that. I mean, that that really was a. a a filmmaker you know make nice kind of thing you know like that mm -hmm. that was them kind of you know satisfying him and him really pushing for that and i'm glad they did yeah i wish it was in there longer and, and everybody's basically been critical of netflix you know in terms of how much money they probably left on the table with with how well it performed in <clears throat> you know only 600 screens but yeah i, I couldn't agree more i mean yeah I, I loved it i i don't know where i fall i mean 
maybe give knives out the edge uh just because it was the first you know and you know you get the meat benoit and all, all that stuff but i don't know there's some things i liked more about not about glass onion than i did l- about knives out you know like kind of six and one half dozen the other in certain aspects but like what what i think the movie really does in in and you know to its benefit and very smartly is like the idea of the the preconception that we have of just of uh, even 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 calling it a knives out mystery but yeah. Like you're kind of alluding to halfway through the movie, it becomes more of a puzzle movie yeah, than a mystery, yeah. really. You know, there's still a mystery at play, but the idea that there's a puzzle also that we're kind of piecing together and it kind of falls into those, kind. it, it kind of like dips its toe in that genre of movie, you know, the puzzle. Yeah. Movie. And I think that kind of mixing that in a little bit um, in this movie was really smart and kind of allowed them to just make it feel a little different than Knives Out does in general. Yeah. Um, I think the cast is great. Yeah, Janelle Monet definitely is the standout. Obviously, I love Benoit. Um, so but yeah, good. I think I think just having everybody at play here. Um, I think Edward Norton is just having a blast in this movie. <laughs> yeah. And you know, and I've actually watched it a couple times now. Um, since we got since we kind of didn't get to record last week, I watched it again. And you know, it definitely is one of those movies that is really rewarding on repeat viewings. Okay. You know, you know, things that definitely stand out way beyond things that are revealed in the movie by Benoit um, about certain characters um, on a, on a rewatch, like you definitely start picking up on things, knowing what you know about the movie once you complete it. But yeah, you you said it, Ronald, there's such a tight screenplay. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be shocked if this, you know, find its way into uh, an Oscar nomination, honestly. And, you know, I think, you know, Ryan Johnson is just like you guys said, He's, he's a special breed and, you know, I've listened to him on a bunch of podcasts over the past couple of weeks and I just love listening to him talk about movies and, you know, his process and, you know, how honestly kind of prolific he's becoming, you know, in terms of what he's got coming out in movies, you know, whether it's on Netflix or he's got a TV series coming out here shortly yeah. uh, with Natasha Leone and uh, called Poker Face that I'm sure we'll talk about on the podcast. But I just I love his output. I love his ethic, uh, his work ethic. I just love him in general. Um, and I just feel like really in line with what he's doing, whether it's the Knives Out movies or just, you know, the other stuff he creates. Um, yeah, definitely a huge recommend for me. One of my favorite movies of the year, probably um, just in terms of enter- entertainment and just rewatchability. Um, and honestly, for you know, it, I feel like for its runtime, I felt like this movie moved fast. You know, for me, like it, it definitely pacing was good. And I think it benefits from that turn that ronald alluded to you know uh, i don't know a third halfway through the movie um but yeah a huge recommend for me i mean I, again it's it's close for me in terms of which one i like more i mean it fits right in there for me with knives out um and i yeah like john said i think i was sending you guys text messages like i just want more of these movies as soon as possible yeah, I, I would love to just see more. Like it's got to be. <laughs> I hope I hope he's he's starting to work on the third one. I think now they 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 were saying so. Uh, hopefully that comes in the next couple of years. Hopefully. Um. Yeah. So let's do this. Let's do. Let's let's say goodbye to our non to our, to our spoiler reverse uh, <laughs> listeners, just so we can talk a little bit about the denouement of this movie. Just because I think there's something so worth mentioning here. And so, yes, uh, here you go, folks. Your warning <clears throat> for spoilers is five, four, three, two, one. Um, you, you mentioned what a blast Ed Norton is having in this movie. Yeah. I think there's nobody, I don't know that anybody else could have played this character and made it work the way that he does. Totally agree. Because he's such a dumbass and such like a douche that even when he's like losing everything it's like he's disbelieving of it i don't know i just think it's so funny that he's like the the character's delusion like is barely starting to crack you know at the end when things are really going south and when he sees that none of these people were his friends and nobody's really going to side with him um i just thought that ed norton i don't know like as far as a villain turn um, you know, and the big reveal of who, like, who's the sort of the, the lousiest person in this movie, you know, it's like, you could sort of predict that it would be him, but I thought it was very pleasurable seeing the, 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 the accidental timeliness of this guy who seemed like yeah. he was, he was a direct parody of Elon Musk, right? When oh Elon God, Musk was yeah. making headlines every day for being, you know, out of control and, 
and uh, you know, not being the shrewd, you know, genius that people wanted to paint him as, or maybe not. Um, anyway, I just thought that was very funny. And I, you know, what do you guys want, think about the reveal? Like, I think that's one of the things in these movies, like you say, puzzle or mystery. The first one kind of had a murder that wasn't really a murder. This one is not the same, but it's kind of in that same zone of like, it's what's happening is not as nefarious and thoroughly evil as it is kind of, there's mundane kind of buffoonery almost. Um, and, you know, it's not quite what you expect, uh, even if you could have predicted that Ed Norton seems like the most likely uh, villain. What did you guys think of the the twist, the reveal? I mean, I think, I think it's, I, I, I like it a lot because I think it plays with this idea that like earlier in the movie, you know, he's the first one that comes to mind. You know, he's the yeah. first one that they mention about like, or 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 that she mentioned the sister mentions. Mm -hmm. You know, about him, about Miles, and I think it's Benoit. It's like, oh no, too obvious. You know, like, you know, yeah. he he'd be a he'd be a target immediately in 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 the, in light of all this stuff he's doing with his, you know, this whatever that product is that he's launching this this new fuel. Um, and, you know, I think that idea that like so many times in these movies, it's like whether it's this or slasher films or whatever, it's like it's so many times it's like the most obvious answer is is or the most obvious suspect is the answer. And yeah. even like a detective, like, you know, as, as skilled and, you know, like a master as Benoit Bloch, like a sister who has no in inclination to this says it right off the bat. And it's dismissed and it's just like when it hits him later in the movie and it all comes together, even he is reacting in a way it's like, it's so dumb that it's you. Yeah. And like, and in, in, in his mind, you know, he's saying like, I told her it wasn't you because mm -hmm. it would be too obvious. And here it is. And it was so dumb how you did one about it. Like, I just loved how that all kind of came together. And, and in that performance, even with uh, Daniel Craig's performance in that scene, it's like, for all the time he'd been like depressed about not having to, 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 to really challenge his intellect and his, and his detective skills. It's like the, the first thing that she said is the one it is. I just love that idea. And like, you know, and the way that Norton kind of handles the situation when he starts to kind of take them apart, peg by peg is just like, I mean, Norton's great, man. He's like one yeah. of the best. He's one of the best. Yeah. I want to see him in more stuff. I want to see him in more stuff. I feel like I don't see him enough. Yeah, it's weird. He's a he's a prominent. Actor. He's like he's like he's like a Wes Anderson actor. Like he's in all his like Wes Anderson movies now. Yeah. And like yeah, I don't That's know. Otherwise, he hasn't really been he hasn't really been a lot in a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um. How do you guys feel about maybe the hint that uh Daniel Craig's uh character may have a partner? Uh, oh, I don't know if that's a hint. I think it's, it's not, pretty much. I think yeah. it's a fact. So yeah. is it a fact? Yeah. 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 I mean, why would he be there? Like, for one thing, why would he be there like baking, you know, it, it but also I think that like that kind of is the final piece of like, we suspect that of Benoit Blanc maybe, but I mean like the mm -hmm. fact that it's just one more way this movie feels like a modern spin on what we've seen before with this type of character, because he, in both movies, he's paired with a young woman. And it yeah. reminds me of one of the things I like about the show Only Murders in the Building, where it's like not once has there been an ounce of like leering older men uh, with younger woman yeah. sensibility. Yeah. None of those jokes. And it's one of the reasons why that show works for audiences, because Steve Martin and Martin Short know better than that. They know that would be gross. And I think that like. Not that you couldn't have sparks. I mean, you get to have character sparks and you get to have this oh, friendship yeah, building, sure. but that idea that it's not going to turn into a will they, won't they, um, for me, finding out that Benoit is gay or confirming it is sort of the thing that makes me go, oh, that is something these movies are doing very deliberately, is pairing yeah. him with younger women who, as you said, may even be more smart than he is or have more on right, the ball right. than he is as far as the situation. Um, but <clears throat> he's so good natured about, about it. Like his relationship with Janelle Monet in this, um, is I don't know. It's great. I mean, I and I and I liked the the since we're in the spoiler zone here. I liked the way they played her death, quote unquote, and then finding out what really happened. Um, and and did, doesn't he get um, does he get hot sauce in his in his eye? Yeah, is that yeah. what happens? Yeah. Or she got hot sauce in her eye? There, there was some. There, I just thought that little the, the little moment well, with yeah, he, he gets it in her eye and then it's running down her yeah right to her nose before they walk away. Right. While she's, she's trying to, to lay sneeze. still. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I I just I just thought that that whole scene again, it's just very clever. Ryan Johnson finds ways to make 
those little moments, even if he's spinning kind of a far-fetched thing, he finds those little moments of detail. And like, that's a great bit to to have to play, but also just seeing the scene from a different view and understanding what's really going on. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what you get in a puzzle movie. Uh, yeah. and, and, uh, and, you know, let's talk also Dave Bautista continues his streak of like coming to serve the movie and playing a great memorable yeah. role. <clears throat> I'm going to say man. it over and over and fucking over again. Best wrestler turn actor. Ryan Johnson no agrees with you. <laughs> no competition. I don't think there's like John Cena is coming up, but there's no comparison right now. He is the most well-adjusted <laughs> actor Gosh, that's a common thread actor. there. I guess James Gunn knows how to pick him, right? <clears throat> oh, for sure, man. For sure. Um, he knows how to yeah. pick a big guy. It's it's really cool to see him work. Like, and, and it it's getting to the point where like Batista isn't the novelty in movies anymore. It's mm -hmm. like whoever else is around him tends to be the novelty. It's it's weird. At, at first he was like, Oh, it's it's the big wrestler guy. Now it's like, who who is he gonna be? playing beside that he that they're going to be the kind of the joke casting sort of thing it's, well i mean i mentioned to you guys that i felt like he was a little bit slimmed down in this and i'm yeah. i find it remarkable that guys that big can find different degrees of big you know that they can be but <laughs> yeah. i do think that like he's got a capability of playing you're right when dave bautista's in a movie you kind of go oh cool he's in this you don't go oh it's a dave bautista movie i know the tone this is going to have i know the right, character he's right. going to play um, and he's even said as much that, you know, he's as 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 great as Drax was to play for him, that he's relieved that it's over because he doesn't want that to be the summation of his career mm -hmm. and the role that he's known for necessarily because it is so silly, um, you know, and it's like I I always I always hope that actors appreciate even when they're playing a silly role like that, that we could tell that they're doing a good job. But mm -hmm. I think just the fact that he's clearly I mean, look at the directors he's worked with and. Um, you know, the kind of roles he gets. Clearly people people like working with him. So, yeah. and yeah, I think he is he is one of the highlights of the movie. And and again, what happens with him is kind of one of the funnier, uh, like random <laughs> yeah, outcomes in sure. the movie, you know, that for doesn't sure. have the importance that it would seem to have, but it also yeah. is so mundane what happens to him. <laughs> yeah. This is so random. How do you feel about the, the thing that came out a, a little while ago about him kind of storming into Warner Brothers and saying, I want to play Bane? How do you feel about that? So are stories like that even verifiable? There have been so many weird stories know. about the about the DC side of things out there. I don't know. I'd like to see it. I think he'd be a really good Bane. He probably would be a good Bane. I mean, what if they did the exact same thing with his voice that they did with uh, <laughs> yeah, right. the, the Nolan film? I mean, I, yeah. Oh, that was rough. I remember going to see, I think I may have told you this, the test screening of yeah. the like first scene before they adjusted the voice it was really hard to understand anything that was being said it was like very faint i saw it with ashley uh yeah. ashley miller you got you got me the shirt yeah oh shit yes yeah uh it was so distant it sounded like he was in the other room like talking through a thick door Mm -hmm. it's like, this is yeah, you've weird. mentioned that before and i think that's wild that it actually was worse than it, it was because in the movie it was still hard it was at least legible but it was still hard to to tell what he was saying half yeah. the time he needs to find somebody else to mix his movies man i felt this i'm bad what i'm i'm afraid about Oppen oppenheimer 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 is it gonna be weird mixed weird? What if like it is tenant? weirdly? Is what it if, gonna be if everybody sounds nah, like Bane? Come on. Yeah, I hope not. <laughs> tenant was weird, man. Tenant tenant was hard to hear. Batman was hard to hear. Certain parts of Batman were hard to hear. Like, I'm like, what fucking please don't do this to me with this new movie. I want to mention real quick, uh, going on the conversation with Dave Batista, looking at yeah. the the year to come. So you know, if you include Glass Onion and end of the year, right, right, in, in 365 days, basically he'll have Glass Onion, Knock at the Cabin, which is the new M Night. That looks film, so good, looks so good. Based on the book by Obviously, Paul Tremblay, which is not mentioned in any of the trailers. With oh wow, kind of yeah, I didn't know it was based on the book. Yeah, Guardians of the Galaxy three, Dune Part two, it's Glassu, and then possibly I don't know if it's going to hit this year or not, but the sequel to Army of the Dead. Oh. The Zack Snyder Netflix franchise he's got. But I mean, uh, that's possibly five big, big movies and, you know, kind of variety different. of movies, yeah. too. Yeah. Like, 
Yeah. So and and yeah, the trailer for Knock at the Cabin looks great. And I mean, he's, and he's basically like the, one of the stars of it. So he yeah. looks like he's star. really a big part of it. And also he looks like he's playing a, yet again a different like a, a new spin on something we haven't quite seen from him. Right. You know? yeah. yeah. I can't wait to see him in that. Yeah, oh, He's yeah. great. We're okay. huge fan. Huge fan of his. The pod. Yeah. 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 He'll probably, he'll probably come on one day, probably. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Totes. We'll, we'll figure it out. Totes, we goats. Um, yeah, so Glass Onion, definitely recommend for me. I think the whole crew here is probably saying recommend it. Check it out. So Netflix now. Uh, and we got Ronald's pick for required viewing next week, The Godfather. Um, now, are we going to talk about The Godfather and do our best movies of the year? Or are we going to kick required viewing Ooh. one week down? Yeah, just so let's, skip a let's week. kick it a week down. Yeah, let's skip this. Let's skip it for this. Move Even on though, down for, move for on a down. best of the year episode. Down the, the Godfather road. is at least at least oh. fits. You know what I mean? Yeah, can, at least can, a great movie like that. Now, is. yeah, let, let's let, we have some other but, conversation we're going to include probably next okay. week yeah. with the best can of. So I, can, can I make a request for next week? To not Ronald or Walker or Ritter it. Tell and me we more. have 11 through 20 are loose, no order. <sighs> we just rattle off 10 movies in no particular order that are not in our top 10. And then top 10 is order. I, I think that, um, but I also think what, what we did last time, that we did this, which was a long time ago, actually, which was like okay. uh, 2019. <laughs> many moons so, ago. Yeah, many moons ago. This this view uh, viewers and the listeners rank, might the, might notice we like haven't done, we haven't done the um we haven't done this in a while, but this is finally a year. We'll get into maybe why this is the year where it was it seemed right to do a best of again. But yeah, if say like if I name my number ten, Ronald, right, right. and it's higher on your list. Right. You tell me, and then I don't talk about it, and we just move on. So that then we only talk about all those big movies one time, technically. Ooh. Like we all, you know. But, but I yes. have some random foreign weird shit that I want to get off my chest. Well, no, that's the same. Well, that's that's the, but then you still but then you talk, would about, talk it. about it. Yeah. Is this just going to be an honorable mentions? No. No, no, no. If it's in your top 10 and you say something at 10 and it's not on either of our lists, you talk about it. Okay. But, but, but if you say something and it's on my list, then I say that's higher on my list. And you say, all right, I'll talk about it when when we when we get to it. But if it's okay. if you're the only I, one yeah. with it on if you're the only one with it on your list, then then when you say it, that's when we talk about it. But it okay. prevents us from doing that thing. And that's again, last time it was like an hour and a half long rather than two and a half hours long yeah, yeah, because yeah. we didn't do two or three segments on all the big movies, the same, you know, redundant movies. So okay. it yeah, makes sense when we do it, Ronald. You, you'll discuss the movie at its highest position. Exactly. And and those who chose it will discuss it at that point together. Yes. And I think oh that God. as we're saying them, we should do the number two, like the yeah. the, the values, yeah. so that at the end of the show, we should announce a, a top five for the movies. For oh, like, wow. Man, that's, that's just that's just that's just an inverse point. So ten yes. to ten to one, it's it's one to ten. Yeah. There's one that I know for a fucking fact. That you guys aren't gonna list that I'm so interested to talk about. Great. Oh, not but be, not because it's just because of how it was released. It's just god damn it. I'm so excited. <laughs> no, I honestly this I'm excited about this too because guys, the the you know, this is the first time in a while we used to do these list episodes all the time too, where we got to surprise each other all the time. So yeah. I think that that's another fun part of this. It's not so much that I think I'm going to surprise you guys that much, but there's still that fun of kind of revealing our picks and our thinking behind it. So um, yes, join us next time when we look back at all the, all the big movies in a big year for movies. Honestly, when I made my list, I was like, man, I love these movies and I haven't even seen all the movies I might consider. And then the following week we will do the Godfather and who knows what else. Oh, well, moviesmovie.com is the website. You can uh, go to the site and subscribe to the podcast on your podcast platform of choice if you're not already subscribed. If you are subscribed, please leave a review or a rating or any kind of thing of that nature if it's available uh, there. Um, and like I mentioned at the top of the show, if you prefer to enjoy this uh, podcast in a video form, you can go over to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash podcast, and subscribe. Uh, make sure if you do subscribe, you hit that little bell so you get notifications every week when the videos drop. 
And uh, yeah, it's crazy. Next week, top 10 of 2023 coming at you. Or 2022. Uh, 2022. Yeah, that's right. That's the that's the year that was. And this is the year. Unless you have is. an inside line. That I don't know. About. <laughs> I was going to announce it next week that I already have my top 10 list of this year. <laughs> I went into the future and I'm now back. I'm now I'm now back to now from the. That makes sense. Yeah, you. That's said a back fun notion. Yeah, we, we, yeah. we were talking about doing our most looked forward to movies. Mm. Maybe we could do where we predict what our yeah. top ten for the year is going to be. <laughs> and then yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> and then compare it at the end. Of, oh, that yeah. would be crazy. Oh, man, that would be an episode for sure. <laughs> It'd be uh, crazy if there's a movie that sucks. Like we think it's yeah. going to be incredible. We're like, oh right. man, it, hey man, it happens. It happens yeah. all the time. Yep. Um. All right. Cool. Well, as always, you've made our day. Thanks. Bye. Lean machine, Jelly Bean.